Yes. As the president watched the bloody attack unfold on Fox News from his dining room, members of Congress and other government officials stepped into the gigantic leadership void created by the president's chilling and studied passivity that day. What you're about to see is previously unseen footage of congressional leaders, both Republicans and Democrats, as they were taken to a secure location during the riot. You'll see how everyone involved was working actively to stop the violence, to get federal law enforcement deployed to the scene to put down the violence and secure the Capitol complex. Not just Democrats like Speaker Nancy Pelosi and House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer, but Republicans like Vice President Pence, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Majority Whip John Thune, and countless other appointees across the administration. All of them did what President Trump was not doing, what he simply refused to do. Take a listen. Uh, we're, we're starting to get surrounded. They're taking the uh, North Front scaffolding. Look at this. We get more munitions. We are not going to be able to hold them. The door has been breached. The people are gaining access into the Capitol. We have got to get to finish the proceedings. Or else we're going to have to come in quickly. Senator Schumer is at a secure location, and they're locked down in the Senate. There has to be some way we can maintain the sense that people have that there is uh, some security or some confidence uh, that government can function and that we can elect the president of the United States. Did we go back into session? We did go back into session, but now apparently everybody on the floor is putting on a desk masks to prepare for a breach. Well, I'm trying to get more information. They're putting on their tear gas masks. I can't. We need an area for the house members. They're all walking over now. Go to the tunnel. I'm going to call up the ethic secretary of DOD. We have some senators who are still in their hideaways. They need massive personnel now. Can you get the Maryland National Guard to come too? I have something to say, Mr. Secretary. Well, I'm going to call the, the, the mayor of Washington, D.C. right now and see what uh, other outreach he has to other police departments, as the uh, leader Hoyer has mentioned. This is Nancy. Uh, Governor, I don't know if you had been approached about the uh, Virginia National Guard. Mr. Hoyer was connect, uh, speaking to uh, uh, Governor Hogan, uh, but I still think you probably need the okay of the, uh, the federal government in order to come into another jurisdiction. Thank you. Oh my gosh. They're just breaking windows. They're doing all, all kinds of, it's really that somebody, they said somebody was shot. It's just, it's just horrendous and all at the instigation of the President of the United States. Okay, thank you, Governor. I appreciate what you're doing. And if you don't mind, I'd like to stay in touch. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Virginia Guard has been called in. You know, I'm just talking to Governor Northam. And what he said is they sent 200 of uh, state police and a unit of the National Guard. They're breaking windows and going in, uh, uh, obviously ransacking our offices and all the rest of that. That's nothing. The, uh, the concern we have about uh, personal harm, safety. personal safety is to just transcends everything, but the fact is on any given day, they're breaking the law in many different ways. And quite frankly, much of it at the instigation of the President of the United States. And now, uh, if, if he could, could at least uh, somebody... Yeah, why don't you get the President to tell them to leave the Capitol, Mr. Attorney General, in your law enforcement responsibility. A public statement, they should all leave. <laughs> Be 
just were waiting for so and so. We need them there now, whoever you got. You okay. have you also have troops. This is Stenny Hoyer. Troops. Okay. We so we have Fort more than time to make that decision. Andrews Air Force Base. All right. Other military bases. Thank you. We Thanks, need Paul. active Bye. duty National Guard. How soon in the future can you have the place evacuated, and pulled you know, cleaned out? I, I don't want to speak for the or just pretend, just pretend for a moment it was the Pentagon or the White House or some other entity that was under siege. And let me say, you can logistically get people there as you make the plan. figure out how we can get this job done today. We talked to Mitch about it earlier. He, uh, he's not in the room right now, but he was with us earlier uh, and said, you know, we want to expedite this and hopefully they could confine it to just one complaint, Arizona, and then we could vote and, and that would be, you know, then just move forward with the rest of the state. The overriding wish is to do it at the Capitol. What we are being told very directly is it's going to take days for the Capitol to be okay again. We've gotten a very bad report about the condition of, of the um, house floor with defecation and all that kind of thing as well. I don't think that that's hard to clean up, but I do think it is uh, more from a security standpoint of making sure that everybody is out of the building and how long will that take? I just got off with the vice president. And I got off with the vice president-elect. So I'll tell okay. But what we left the conversation with, because he said he had the impression from Mitch that Mitch wants to get everybody back to do it there. Yes. I said, well, we're getting a counterpoint that is, we could take time uh, to clean up the poo poo that they're making all over them, literally and figuratively in the Capitol, and that uh, it may take days to get back. In this video, you just saw Senator Chuck Schumer urging Acting Attorney General Jeff Rosen to get President Trump to call off the rioters. Of course, Acting AG Rosen did take action to defend the government, as did many other officials, but congressional leadership recognized on a bipartisan basis that President Trump was the only person who could get the mob to end its violent siege of the Congress, leave the Capitol, and go home. Here's Senator McConnell speaking after January 6th about how President Trump abandoned his duties and failed to do his job. It was obvious that only President Trump could end this. He was the only one who could. Former aides publicly begged him to do so. Loyal allies frantically called the administration. The president did not act swiftly. He did not do his job. He didn't take steps so federal law could be faithfully executed and order restored. No. In the midst of this violent chaos, Kevin McCarthy implored Donald Trump to tell his supporters in the mob to leave the Capitol. And when that didn't work, McCarthy called Trump's adult children to try to get them to intercede with Trump to call off the insurrectionary violence. 
In our prior hearings, we showed you a description of what McCarthy told Republican Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler about his conversation with Trump during the violence. Another witness, Mick Mulvaney, President Trump's former chief of staff, has also come forward and corroborated her shocking account. who's the Republican leader about this, um, and he said he called Donald Trump, he finally got through to Donald Trump, and he said, you have got to get on TV, you've got to get on Twitter, you've got to call these people off. You know what the president said to him? This is as it's happening. He said, well, Kevin, these are my people. You know, these are, these are Antifa. And Kevin responded and said, no, they're your people. They literally just came through my office windows, and my staff are running for cover. I mean, they're running for their lives. You need to call them off. And the president's response to Kevin, to me, was chilling. He said, well, Kevin, I guess they're just more upset about the election uh, you know, theft than you are. And that's, you know, you've seen widespread reports of, of Kevin McCarthy and the president having a basically a swearing conversation. That's when the swearing meant, because the president was basically saying, no, nah, I'm okay with this. Um, I, had, I had a conversation at some point in the day or week after uh, the uh, the riot with Kevin McCarthy. Yeah, it was very similar to what Jamie had, uh, the conversation she had retold about how he called and asked the president to get them to stop, and the president told them something along the lines of, Kevin, maybe these people are just more angry about this than you are, maybe more upset. I had the conversation similar to that with Kevin in the day to week after, after the riot. And we know how Kevin McCarthy described President Trump's conduct, both in public and in private. The president bears responsibility for Wednesday's attack on Congress by mob rioters. He should have immediately denounced the mob when he saw what was unfolding. These facts require immediate action by President Trump. Accept his share of responsibility. Quell the brewing unrest and ensure President-elect Biden is able to successfully begin his term. But let me be very clear to all of you, and I've been very clear to the president. He bears responsibilities for his words and actions. No ifs, ands, or buts. I asked him personally today, does he hold responsibility for what happened? Does he feel bad about what happened? He told me he does have some responsibility for what happened. Um, and he needs to acknowledge that. 2.24 p.m., knowing the deadly riot was now bearing down on his own vice president, President Trump composed and sent a tweet attacking Vice President Pence, accusing him of cowardice for not unilaterally rejecting electoral college votes for Joe Biden and simply handing Trump the presidency. The impact of that tweet was foreseeable and predictable. It further inflamed the mob, which was chanting, hang Mike Pence and provoke them to even greater violence. This deliberate decision to further enrage the mob against Vice President Pence cannot be justified by anything that President Trump might have thought about the election. The tweet came precisely at the time Pence's Secret Service detail was most seriously concerned for the Vice President's physical safety. We've obtained new documents from the Secret Service, real-time chats that underscored the threat they knew the vice president would be facing because of the president's escalating incitement of the mob. After Trump's tweet, one agent in the Secret Service's intelligence division immediately warned, POTUS just tweeted about Pence, probably not going to be good for Pence. Another agent reported the dramatic impact of Trump's anti-Pence tweet on his followers. POTUS said he lacked courage over 24,000 likes in under two minutes. Employees at Twitter were nervously monitoring the situation. They knew that certain Twitter users were riding at the Capitol and tweeting about it at the same time. As the afternoon progressed, the company detected a surge in violent hashtags on the platform, including lines of lethal incitement like, execute Mike Pence. Listen to this former Twitter employee, Anika Navaroli, who first came to the committee anonymously, but has now bravely agreed to be named because she wants to speak out about the magnitude of the threats facing our people. And you're also seeing content on the platform at the time um, 
that was directing towards the vice president. Hashtag execute my pets. They were literally calling for his execution. As this tweet was going out. Yes. And after, in response to this tweet too, because I think as, as many of as many of Donald Trump's tweets did, it again fanned the flames. And it was individuals who were already constructing gallows, who were already willing and able and wanting to execute someone and looking for someone to be killed. Now the individual who has called upon them to begin this coup is now pointing the finger at another individual um, while they're ready to do this. Here's a small sample of the reactions that President Trump's Fan the Flames tweet provoked among Capitol rioters in real time. What percentage of the crowd has gone to the Capitol? 100%. It is is spread like wildfire that Pence has betrayed us and everybody's marching on the Capitol, all million of us. It's insane. Between 2.30 and 2.35, within 10 minutes of President Trump's tweet, thousands of rioters overran the line that the Metropolitan Police Force's Civil Disturbance Unit was holding on the west side of the Capitol. This was the first time in the history of the Metropolitan Police Department that a security line like that had ever been broken. President Trump's conduct that day was so shameful and so outrageous that it prompted numerous members of the White House staff and other Trump appointees to resign. In prior hearings, you've heard Deputy National Security Advisor Matt Pottinger and Deputy White House Press Secretary Sarah Matthews explain why they felt compelled to resign on that day. Since then, we've spoken to more high-ranking officials, like President Trump's envoy to Northern Ireland and former Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney and Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao, who resigned after the 6th in protest of Trump's misconduct and to dissociate themselves from his role in the violence. Take a listen to what they had to say. I was stunned by violence and uh, was stunned by the president's apparent indifference to the violence. Now is the time for the president to presidential. I thought he failed at doing it. He failed at a critical time to be the sort of leader that the the nation needed. I think the events at the Capitol, uh, however they occurred, were shocking. And it was something that, as I mentioned in my statement, that I could not put aside. And at a particular point, the events were such that it was impossible for me to continue given my personal values and my philosophy. I came as an immigrant to this country. I believe in this country. I believe in a peaceful transfer of power. I believe in democracy. And so I was a, it was a, a decision that I made on my own. When security assistance began to arrive at the Capitol and the tide turned against the insurrection, President Trump finally gave his painfully belated instruction at 4.17 p.m. So after multiple hours of rioting and more than 100 serious injuries suffered by our law enforcement officers, the crowd finally began to disperse. Listen carefully to what they said as they decided to leave the Capitol. Finally, at 6.01, President Trump tweeted again, not to condemn the mass violence in any way, but rather to excuse and glorify it. Significantly, he made it clear that he considered the violence perfectly foreseeable and predictable. Check it out. These are the things and events that happen 
when a sacred landslide election victory is so unceremoniously, viciously stripped away from great patriots who have been badly, unfairly treated for so long. These are the things that happen, he said, giving the whole game away. Trump was telling us that the vice president, the Congress, and all the injured and wounded cops, some of whom are with us today, got what was coming to us. According to Trump, January 6th should not be a day that lives in shame and infamy in our history, but rather in glory. Remember this day forever, he wrote proudly, as if he were talking about D-Day or the Battle of Yorktown. Trump did nothing to stop the deadly violence for obvious reasons. He thought it was all justified, he incited it, and he supported it. Would it have been possible at any moment for the president to walk down to the podium in the briefing room? and, and tell, talk to the nation at any time between when you first gave him the advice at 2 o'clock and 4.17 on the video statement. Would that have been possible? Would it have been possible? Yes. Yes, it would have been possible. The president had wanted to make a statement um, and address the American people. He could have been on camera almost instantly. And conversely, the White House press corps has offices that are located directly behind the briefing room. And so if he had wanted to make an address from the Oval Office, we could have assembled the White House press corps probably in a matter of minutes to get them into the Oval for him to do an on-camera address. Mr. Chairman, nothing in law or fact could justify the president's failure to act. And, and I assume you also would agree the president has a particular obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. That is one of the president's obligations, correct. Mr. Chairman, in numerous places, our Constitution strongly opposes insurrection and rebellion. Article 1 gives Congress the power to call forth the militia to suppress insurrections. Section 3 of the 14th Amendment disqualified from holding federal and state office anyone who has sworn an oath to defend the Constitution but betrays it by engaging in insurrection or rebellion. It was President Lincoln at the start of the Civil War in 1861 who best explained why democracy rejects insurrection. Insurrection, he said, is a war upon the first principle of popular government, the rights of the people. American democracy belongs to all the American people, not to a single man. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. During this committee's first hearing in July of last year, our witnesses were four police officers who helped repel the riots of January 6th. We asked them what they hoped to see the committee accomplish over the course of our investigation. Officer Gunnell wanted to know why the rioters were made to believe that the election process was rigged. Officer Fanon asked us to look into the actions and activities that resulted in the day's event. Officer Hodges was concerned about whether anyone in power had a role. Officer Dunn put it simply, get to the bottom of what happened. We've worked for more than a year to get those answers. We've conducted more than a thousand interviews and depositions. We received and reviewed hundreds of thousands of pages of documents. Thanks to the tireless work of our members and investigators, we've left, we have left no doubt, none that Donald Trump led an effort to upend American democracy that directly resulted in the violence of January 6th. He tried to take away the voice of the American people in choosing their president and replace the will of the voters with his will to remain in power. He is the one person at the center of the story of what happened on January 6th. So we want to hear from him. The committee needs to do everything in our power to tell the most complete story possible and provide recommendations to help ensure nothing like January 6th ever happens again. We need to be fair and thorough and gain a full context for the evidence we've obtained. But the need for this committee to hear from Donald Trump goes beyond 
our fact-finding. This is a question about accountability to the American people. He must be accountable. He is required to answer for his actions. He's required to answer to those police officers who put their lives and bodies on the line to defend our democracy. He's required to answer to those millions of Americans who votes he wanted to throw out as part of his scheme to remain in power. And whatever is underway to ensure this accountability under law, this committee will demand a full accounting to every American person of the event of January 6th. So it is our obligation to seek Donald Trump's testimony. There's precedent in American history for Congress to compel the testimony of a president. president. There's also precedent for presidents to provide testimony and documentary evidence to congressional investigators. We also recognize that a subpoena to a former president is a serious and extraordinary action. That's why we want to take this step in full view of the American people, especially because the subject matter at issue is so important to the American people and the stakes are so high for our future and our democracy. And so, I recognize the Vice Chair, Ms. Cheney of Wyoming, to offer a motion. Mr. Chairman, pursuant to today's notice, I send to the desk a committee resolution and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the resolution. Committee Resolution 1, resolved that the chairman be and is hereby directed to subpoena Donald J. Trump for documents and testimony in connection with the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol pursuant to Section 5C4 of House Resolution 503 and Clause 2M of Rule 11 of the Rules of the House of Representatives. The gentlewoman from Wyoming is recognized on her resolution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, our committee now has sufficient information to answer many of the critical questions posed by Congress at the outset. We have sufficient information to consider criminal referrals from multiple individuals and to recommend a range of legislative proposals to guard against another January 6th. But a key task remains. We must seek the testimony under oath of January 6th central player. More than 30 witnesses in our investigation have invoked their Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. And several of those did so specifically in response to questions about their dealings with Donald Trump directly. Here are a few examples. This is Roger Stone with Oath Keepers at the Willard Hotel on the morning of January 6th. And here is Mr. Stone testifying before our committee. Did you speak to President Trump on his private cell phone on either January 5th or January 6th? Uh, once again, on advice of counsel, I will assert my Fifth Amendment right to respectfully decline to answer your question. This is General Michael Flynn walking with Oath Keepers on December 12th, 2020. And here is General Flynn's testimony before our committee. Did you, General Flynn, talk to President Trump? at any point on January 6, 2021. Let's go. Here is John Eastman fraudulently instructing tens of thousands of angry protesters that the vice president could change the election outcome on January 6th. Later on this same day, Dr. Eastman acknowledged in writing that Donald Trump knew what he was attempting was illegal. Here is John Eastman testifying before our committee. Did President Trump authorized you to discuss publicly your January 4th, 2021 conversation with him. Fifth. So is it your position that you can discuss in the media direct conversations you had with the President of the United States, but you will not discuss those same conversations with this committee? Fifth. Here is Jeff Clark who conspired with Donald Trump to corrupt the Department of Justice. President Trump wanted to appoint Jeff Clark as acting attorney general. 
And as you can see in this call log we obtained from the National Archives, he did so. And here is Mr. Clark testifying before our committee. Mr. Clark, when did you first talk directly with President Trump? Fifth. Uh, Mr. Clark, did you discuss with President Trump allegations of fraud in the 2020 election? Fifth. Other witnesses have also gone to enormous lengths to avoid testifying about their dealings with Donald Trump. Steve Bannon has been tried and convicted by a jury of his peers for contempt of Congress. He is scheduled to be sentenced for this crime later this month. Criminal proceedings regarding Peter Navarro continue. And Mark Meadows, Donald Trump's former chief of staff, has refused to testify based upon executive privilege. The committee's litigation with him continues. Mr. Chairman, at some point, the Department of Justice may well unearth the facts that these and other witnesses are currently concealing. But our duty today is to our country and our children and our Constitution. We are obligated to seek answers directly from the man who set this all in motion. And every American is entitled to those answers so we can act now to protect our republic. So this afternoon, I am offering this resolution that the committee direct the chairman to issue a subpoena for relevant documents and testimony under oath from Donald John Trump in connection with the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. If there's no further debate, the question is on agreeing to the resolution. Those in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed is no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Mr. Chairman, I request a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Cheney. Aye. Ms. Cheney, aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren, aye. Mr. Schiff? Aye. Mr. Schiff, aye. Mr. Aguilar? Aye. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mrs. Murphy? Aye. Mrs. Murphy, aye. Mr. Raskin? Aye. Mr. Raskin, aye. Mrs. Luria? Aye. Mrs. Luria, aye. Mr. Kensinger? Kensinger, aye. Mr. Kensinger, aye. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. The clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, on this vote, there are nine ayes and zero noes. The resolution is agreed to. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The chair requests that those in the hearing room remain seated until the Capitol Police have escorted members from the room. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned. And with the bang of the gavel, there we saw it. Uh, the chairman of the committee there, Benny Thompson, closing out this formal business meeting. He, he did not want to call it a hearing so that they could take a vote. And you saw one by one, each member of the committee, all nine of them, issuing an I. There were nine eyes total to agree with issuing a formal subpoena for the former president of the United States, Donald John Trump. We're going to be right back with much more analysis on this. I'm Veronica Del Cruz here in Atlanta, and you have been watching the January 6th public hearings. We'll be right back. These are not the moments that break us, but they will be the ones that make us. And while we've already learned that we're not invincible, we'll find that as we band together, we're strong and we will overcome. These are the moments that remind us what is truly important. We'll continue to help our neighbors. We'll continue to look out for those in need. And together, we'll make tomorrow a place we can all be proud to call the future. Because tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow is made up of what we make of ourselves today.
So today, I'm asking you to join with us in focusing on what is truly important, helping kids in need right now and into the future. For the past 100 years, Shriners Hospitals for Children has been helping children in need because of the monthly gifts from caring people like you. Please call the number on your screen right now. When you do, you'll be helping all of us do amazing things. With your gift of just $19 a month, only 63 cents a day, we'll send you this adorable Love to the Rescue blanket as a thank you. And while I know not everyone can give right now, if you can give, just go online to loveshriners.org to help kids like me today. Your monthly gift makes a difference. You make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving. Please call or go online right now to loveshriners.org. Your call will help a child in need to have a future full of hope and possibilities. Thank you. Coming up on Newsy Tonight, the last January 6th hearing before the midterm elections. We found some new things that we will be able to present. Did the Senate committee accomplish what it set out to do? And where does it go from here? Tonight at 8, 7 central on Newsy Tonight. There's a better way to begin your mornings. Welcome to the Morning Rush. Thanks so much. Stories that will shape each day so you can get on with yours. Make sure you stay with us as we monitor this developing story. Morning Rush. Weekdays starting at 7, 6 central. Only on Newsy. Veronica Dela Cruz here in Atlanta, and you've been watching the Capitol insurrection hearings. I want to get you right out to Newsy Congressional Correspondent Nathaniel Reed, who has been watching right alongside me. He's outside the hearing room right now on Capitol Hill. All right, so Nate, we just saw the vote go down. Um, nine eyes, zero nays or nos. Take us through what comes next and what exactly the vote means. Well, look, Veronica, I think we need the context, first of all, that this was a fairly surprising vote. We did not go into today thinking that they were going to vote to uh, compel uh, former President Trump to testify by issuing a subpoena uh, to him. This is a fairly rare situation, uh, issuing a subpoena to a former president. There is some precedent to issue a subpoena to a sitting president. You might remember Bill Clinton had that happen to him uh, in the 1990s uh, around his impeachment trial. Uh, but at the same time, issuing the subpoena to a former president is a fairly rare event. And they held this uh, vote publicly, uh, really with almost no advance notice at the beginning of the hearing they teased ahead to potentially holding a vote for someone we later learned uh, through sources that it was going to be former president trump and as you saw they held that vote now chairman benny thompson gave his justification for why they decided to hold that vote in the moments before they took it that was a nine to zero vote with no members of the committee voting against it let's listen so it is our obligation to seek donald trump's testimony there's precedent in American history for Congress to compel the testimony of a president. President, There's also precedent for presidents to provide testimony and documentary evidence to congressional investigators. We also recognize that a subpoena to a former president is a serious and extraordinary action. That's why we want to take this step in full view of the American people especially because the subject matter at issue is so important to the American people and the stakes are so high for our future and our democracy. And look, this did not come lightly. This is something that the committee has agonized over for months. The question from reporters constantly to members of the January 6th committee is, are you going to bring in former President Trump? Are you going to attempt to bring in former President Trump for an interview? Are you going to issue him a subpoena? They have not been willing to answer that question in the past. They've said, no, not right now. We're not going to do it at this time. We haven't made that determination yet. Well, today they've not only made that determination, but they've taken that subpoena vote, which is fairly unusual for the committee, publicly as well making clear that they all want to bring him in. Uh, you might have heard right, uh, just a couple moments ago that uh, Liz Cheney, the Republican vice chair of the committee, made clear that it's quite possible that President Trump could do what other members uh, of uh, other people who've received subpoenas from the committee have done, which is come in and plead the fifth, something that many of Trump's allies 
have done when uh, interviewed by the January 6th committee. Again, we do not know whether former President Trump is actually going to respond to the subpoena. I don't know whether he's reacted to it yet because this happened just a couple of moments ago. But certainly former President Trump will now be issued that subpoena. He'll be asked to come in and provide testimony to the committee. It's not exactly clear if there's been any outreach between the committee and his lawyers previously, but certainly we can expect President Trump to react quite strongly to this. He has uh, hit the select committee in the past. He does not like the January 6th select committee. He's referred to them as the unselect committee, and so clearly he's probably going to react somewhat strongly to this. We don't know whether he's actually going to come in and testify, but this is a very, very significant move on the part of the committee actually taking that step and being fully mindful of where they took it. They did this during a live hearing, well, not a hearing, a technically a committee business meeting uh, as they changed the classification in order to take that uh, rare step. So certainly it's uh, notable that the committee decided to do that on what could be their final actual live uh, hearing. They char were characterized for holding those hearings throughout the summer. This could potentially be their final one. It definitely looked different in terms of what it was comprised of. It was a good deal longer than some of the previous hearings. And it also in uh, included statements from every one of the nine members of the committee. Previously, they've kind of done more thematic hearings where they focus on specific aspects of former President Trump's actions. This one, I guess you could say, was fairly interdisciplinary. We saw everything from them taking that uh, subpoena vote to addressing things they've uh, mentioned in previous hearings to additional new information as well. We even had new video footage. One of the things that we saw in this hearing for the first time was footage of uh, former Vice President Mike Pence on the phone with bipartisan congressional leaders uh, saying what he felt was the uh, situation while January 6th was ongoing and they were sequestered in a secure location. I want you to listen to that uh, brief clip that they played during the hearing today. I'm literally standing with uh, the chief of police from uh, you know, the U.S. Capitol Police. He just informed me what you will hear through official channels, Paul Irving, your sergeant at arms, will inform you that their best information is that they believe that uh, the House and the Senate will be able uh, to reconvene in roughly an hour. Good news. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. So, look, this was a committee hearing which was uh, like and unlike previous hearings. For one, we did see some of that new footage, which this committee has been characterized by. There were no live witnesses this entire time. We did hear new information from people we hadn't necessarily heard from before. But at the same time, there were no live witnesses. They played on uh, never before seen clips uh, during this hearing. And certainly, uh, they've tried to make their case, their complete case for why they want to call in former President Trump to give his testimony. Again, Veronica, we do not know if he's going to comply with the committee's subpoena. Yeah, you know, it's taken them a really long time, Nate, to get to this point. They've had eight hearings prior to this one. They've combed through thousands of documents. They've, li they've listened to thousands of different witness statements, witness testimony, lots of interviews. Um, what comes next in all of this, Nate? Let's just say that Trump fails to appear. Let's just say that Trump decides that he doesn't want to comply with that subpoena. What could happen? Well, look, in the past when uh, people who've been called before this committee have not uh, cooperated with the subpoenas, I think the most notable one uh, would probably be Steve Bannon. There was, a, there was a motion put forward by the committee to hold them in contempt of Congress for refusing to comply with the subpoena. Again, I have to caution here, Veronica, we just don't know if that's a step the committee will take. We don't know if they're going to hold any more public hearings, whether they're actually going to take any steps to enforce this subpoena beyond sending it to the former president's uh, team. But certainly what they've done in the past is they've issued these contempt of Congress referrals trying to get the Justice Department to prosecute uh, uh, various people like, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, former Trump advisors and people like uh, Steve Bannon for refusing to comply with the select committee's uh, subpoenas. And so that is potentially a step that they could take down the line if former President Trump does not comply with this. But we have to remember the clock is ticking here. The committee, uh, this is their final potential, this is the final meeting they've advised so far. We don't know if they're going to hold any more public hearings. And you might remember we're just a couple of months from the election. If the House of Representatives ends up under Republican control, if Republican 
Republicans win a majority in the midterm elections, there's a very good chance that this committee is probably going to wrap up uh, before the 118th Congress takes its seats. Republicans have made very clear that if this committee stays around, they'll either get rid of it or they could potentially vastly shift the focus of the January 6th committee looking at Pelosi's failures. That's something that uh, House uh, 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 Republican leader Kevin McCarthy has hinted at in previous weeks. And so certainly we don't know what the future is for this committee. We also don't know what the future is for this subpoena. And even if they were to try and hold former President Trump in contempt of Congress for refusing to comply if he chooses to not comply with this subpoena, that would require a full vote from both the committee and the House of Representatives. That's a very politically challenging and politically charged vote for members of Congress to take to try and uh, hold a former president in contempt of Congress. But uh, again, Veronica, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. We still don't know whether former President Trump is actually going to answer the subpoena and whether or not he actually plans to appear before this committee to assist them in their investigation and answer questions related to their investigation of the attack on the Capitol. Let's go ahead and talk about the timing and all of this for a second, Nate, because like you're just saying, midterm elections are right around the corner. They're about a month away now. And the committee's ultimate goal here, I think, was to show that the former president is a danger to democracy. How do you think all of this could play out? How do you think this could all affect the midterm elections overall? Well, look, I think my colleague Andrew Rafferty has uh, looked a lot into whether or not voters actually care about this. There's not a lot of signs that this is something that voters care a lot about. But even in my travels, just anecdotally, across the country, going to various swing states where uh, this should be a massive issue, especially for Democrats who are hoping to hold the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives, I very rarely hear voters bring up the fact that they care a lot about the January 6th hearing, so that's a compelling reason for them to vote against their typical preferred party or something that factors in to their discussion. We hear a lot more about kitchen table issues, inflation, the economy, abortion rights and abortion access. I have heard in the past from some voters that they care about the work of the January 6th committee, but I'd say a large number of voters, I think, are, you know, in some ways ready to move on. That's something I've heard from Republican strategists as well, that this is not something that is factoring into average kitchen table dis uh, discussions, especially as voters are preparing to go out and cast their ballots. Early voting is already open in some swing states. Certainly, I think uh, that there are members of the committee, like Liz Cheney, who's made very clear that it is her goal to make sure former President Trump does never end up in the White House ever again, that the former president and that uh, um, uh, members uh, of uh, swing states, people who are going to vote in the upcoming election, are watching these hearings and making uh, their decisions based on uh, the danger to democracy this committee has tried to present the former president as. So clearly this is something that I think uh, is done with the midterm elections in mind. I just don't know uh, and I don't have the numbers as to whether uh, uh, swing voters actually care about these things. All right, Newsy Congressional Correspondent Nathaniel Reed, we do appreciate it, and we'll be checking back with you. I'm Veronica Dela Cruz here in Atlanta, and you've been watching what could be the final hearing in the Capitol insurrection hearings. We'll be right back after a quick break. If you, like many people, are covered by both Medicare and your state's Medicaid, here's something important to know. Medicare annual enrollment is here and ends December 7th. So now's a great time to look at a United Healthcare dual complete plan. It could give you even more health benefits than you already have. To find out if you or someone you care about is eligible, it's easy. Call now to talk with us. We can explain it all and answer your questions. Medicaid gives you benefits and Medicare gives you some too. But a dual complete plan can add even more benefits and features compared to original Medicare. You'll get $0 co-pays on all covered prescriptions, including brand names. And depending on where you live, you could enjoy other benefits too, like more dental care and rides to and from your doctor or pharmacy. Most plans even give you up to $300 a month to help pay for covered over-the-counter products, groceries, and new this year utility bills. And best of all, with this plan, there's no extra cost to you. Remember, if you have Medicare and Medicaid, chances are you could get a dual complete plan. So call now to talk with us. Our agents are available to help. We know healthcare can be confusing. United Healthcare can straighten things out. 
And with over 40 years of experience, you can count on us to be there for you. With a dual complete plan, you could have $0 copays on all covered prescriptions. Help paying for covered over-the-counter products, groceries, and utility bills. More dental coverage, too. All at no extra cost. If you have both Medicare and Medicaid, you may be eligible for dual complete. Hurry. Annual enrollment ends December 7th. So call the number on your screen now to see if you're eligible or to enroll. There's more for you with a United Healthcare dual complete plan. When the details take precedence, the rest falls perfectly into place. We strip away everything but the essential. And what we're left with are thoughtful bedrooms for modern living. Thuma. What are my stats? Well, my investments are tracking up, my house will be paid off in 12 years, and I'll retire at 61. Take control of your finances with Quicken. Try risk-free for 30 days. You done yet? It's 2 a.m. Why are you still scrolling through videos? You're not paying me overtime here. If you really want to see something new, why not change those shades that have been broken for the past two years? Let's tap the Thumbtack app, and in a matter of seconds, we'll find a pro to install new shades. Okay. With Thumbtack, you can easily find top-rated professionals for every home project. Thumbtack, the easy way to care for your home. I want to cherish this moment. A few months ago, I wasn't sure Brian would ever be ready for a sleepover. Really, I reduced his anxiety and impulsive behavior. He's a happier kid, and we love Brillia because it's non-prescription and doesn't have harmful side effects. Brillia for Children has a 100% money-back guarantee. Visit discoverbrillia.com today to learn more. You asleep? Uh, do we have enough life insurance? How would just one of us afford the house, car, uh, Jason's college? Ethos Life. Ethos Life? Go to ethoslife.com and get your personalized quote in seconds and apply online in minutes, often without a medical exam. And Ethos is very affordable. Hey, I just got my free quote with Ethos. That's great, sweetie. Sweetie? Get a free personalized quote at ethoslife.com. Veronica Del Cruz here in Atlanta. Welcome back to our live coverage of the Capitol insurrection hearings. I want to get you live right now to Newsy's political director, Andrew Rafferty, who joins us from our D.C. Bureau with more analysis right here. All right, Andrew, so we just saw the meeting wrap up. How surprising was this vote to subpoena the former president in the final moments of this meeting? Yeah, well, Veronica, it certainly was a surprise. I think a lot of folks, as you mentioned, thought this was going to be the last public hearing. And it surprised not only because of the significance of uh, doing this to a former president, but also thinking about just the realities of how this operation is going to work over the next few months, specifically after the midterm election. We know that they are on what we assume to be a very tight de deadline if Republicans who are poised to take over the House of Representatives after the midterms do take control of this uh, panel will most certainly be disbanded. And so if you look back at some of the other subpoenas that have been issued to folks like Steve Bannon, Mark Meadows, that is a process that has played out over a long period of time. The subpoenas come out, there's a number of weeks that the lawyers for these individuals have to respond. And if they do not respond, then perhaps it goes the legal route. Of course, there is a lot of jockeying we have seen with some of these other high profile individuals who have been asked for information. The lawyers for C. Bannon tried to argue in their court case uh, that they had actually been cooperating, but there was a misunderstanding about the deadline. So whatever happens to go to Trump's legal team, you can almost certainly imagine that there will be some negotiations that begin. And Donald Trump himself and his legal team will most likely try to stall out the clock a bit because there is some reality that regardless of whether or not this committee's future is solidly uh, committed to continuing going forward, the American public itself is growing a little bit leery of this. And so there is, this is a committee that's very much uh, in aware of 
the public perception. They brought in television producers. They're aware of how the information they are giving is playing and resonating with the American public. And if there is a growing wariness over just the issue of January 6th, that there's a willingness by the American public to move on, then that obviously poses some challenges to them as well, Veronica. We're running out of time here, Andrew. Uh, but quickly, I wanted to get your thoughts uh, as to how this is all going to play out. How do you think this affects the midterm elections? Yeah, well, it's interesting, and there's uh, a great question, and we don't have a great sense because there are so many data points, but I'll show you one. This is from Monmouth University. It asks, the question, is Trump directly responsible for January 6th? And you can see where public opinion is back in June. That was really the middle of these hearings. Some of the most explosive testimony happened with Cassidy Hutchison. It was around that time. July, that's kind of when we saw that summer hiatus begin. And then now, you see the numbers are pretty much the same. It was a little bit higher during the middle of these of these hearings. And so uh, we have seen, that's not to say that there has not been an impact. We have seen a number of Republican candidates, Senate candidates in particular, uh, sort of walk back previous claims about election fraud as a pivot from the primary election to the general election. They know that the idea that the election was stolen, that's a core of their platform, is generally not popular in a lot of these battleground states. And you certainly can credit the January 6th committee for uh, having kind of reinstalled, reinstated that philosophy with the American public, Veronica. All right, we don't have a lot of time, Andrew. We've got about 30 seconds here. Um, was there any other, w w were there any other takeaways that you want to go ahead and, and leave us with as we wrap up today's coverage? Yeah, well, I think the video of Pelosi, Schumer, that behind the scenes video, uh, that was really compelling. And I think that's the sort of visual evidence that I think we'll be talking about uh, in the coming weeks. Even as this, uh, we think we know everything about what happened that day, but these uh, committee members have done a good job of presenting new information. All right, Andrew Rafferty, the latest from today's hearing. I'm Veronica Dela Cruz. Thank you so much for joining us for Newsy's live special coverage of what might be the final January 6th public hearing. Stay with us. We're back after this.